Welcome everybody. I am so excited to present to you our IDEC Pacific West virtual collaborative. This is the first one of its kind. It's kind of a test thing for IDEC to see how this is going to work. So thank you for being here to support us and to be with us. So our keynote presenter um, is going to kick us off first. But first, just a couple of reminders to keep this so it kind of streamlines for everybody. If you guys can make sure that your camera is actually off and that you are muted, it will help with the streaming for everyone as they are here. And so we're gonna, uh, if we see someone's camera on, don't be surprised if we turn it off or if we mute you. And we'll have opportunity to, to ask questions where you can unmute yourself when you're ready, or uh, we can always, watch for questions in the chat. So please just remember uh, cameras off and muted when you can. So with that out of the way, I am very excited to present to you our keynote speaker. Uh, Ted Moore is gonna be joining us. He'll be teach talking about creating AI generated images for ideation and interior design and architecture. Uh, I work with Ted, he presented this to my uh, place of work, and it was so wonderful. I begged him to please come and share it with educators because it's something that we all want to see and want to learn and grow on. So uh, just really quick, a little bit about Ted. He was the 2023 president of the Board of Regents for the American College of Healthcare Architects. He's the task force leader on the soon to be realized 2023 ACHA VA task force report. He's the project leader for integrated project delivery and design only services on complex healthcare projects, which we all know healthcare is a beast. He's an experienced planner, designer, and team builder of architects, engineers, contractors, and clinicians. And he's an advanced technology user and leader in design, simulation, energy modeling, and visualization. So with that, Ted, I'm going to stop my screen share and let you take it from here. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody see the screen okay and hear me okay? All good? All right. Well, um, as Heidi said, I work with Heidi at the Haskell Company. I'm a healthcare architect. And my focus today is on the broad topic of AI, but I'm going to focus in on a uh, just a very narrow aspect of it. And that is how do we use it as a design tool? How do we create ideas? How, how do we iterate those ideas? And um, I, I do a lot of it for exterior design and uh, also for interior design. So I'm gonna try to show you some examples of that today. And then hopefully I'll run through all these slides. It's gonna be a lot. And then uh, hopefully I can answer questions at the end. So these are the takeaways I'm hoping to leave you with today. I want you to understand something. I'm kind of a control freak. If you were like me and you like to, you know, look at that column wrap as being 24 by 24 is just too chunky. I'd like to get it down to 20 by 20 and get it tighter to that steel column. Um, and you like that kind of control. This is something you're going to have to get over. So AI is not fully controllable. So I want you to think of it as something that is very conceptual and you're working with a broad brush. Uh, but what it can do is it can produce an astounding number of ideas in just a really short period of time. And that is where the real power of the tool is. Um, whether you believe it or not, AI is being used by your competition, your peers. And if you are uh, an educator, believe it or not, it, it's being used by your students too. Um, sometimes that gets a little shock. Um, AI can automate any process that's kind of well-documented, where AI, you know, you hear a lot about it in the, in the news, it's not really capable of what we term as general intelligence. So I'm very optimistic about the tool uh, helping us in the future uh, because it's still gonna ultimately boil down to a human evaluating whether or not that's a good design and whether or not that's good for life safety and so on. Um, so AI is only going to be able to, you know, automate some of those menial tasks and, and streamline our process. So I'm, um, I'm an eternal optimist when it comes to technology. I have been around where I drew on the board. I went through the CAD revolution. I went through the 3D parametric revolution and the BIM revolution. 
and all of the design viz tools that went with it, including uh, uh, virtual environments. And there were always people along the way that were against moving from one platform to the other. So um, keep an open mind about AI. And I'm hoping that with what I show you today, I'm gonna to try to keep it at a, a beginner level that you will feel more comfortable about using some of these tools to augment your own skill set. So here's the agenda. I'm gonna to touch on these nine items and then hopefully have time for some questions. Just real quick, I am gonna jump into the intellectual property concerns, uh, massive iteration. I'm gonna to touch on my favorite commercial AI products. I'm gonna show you the low cost AI tools uh, that are really dominant in the market. And then I'm gonna focus on uh, three workflows through MidJourney. And then I'll tell you what's coming new in MidJourney too. So first off, all of these backgrounds were created in AI. I did all the backgrounds for this slideshow in, in about 10 minutes. So um, real easy to generate stuff quickly. All right, the tough issue that I want to start with is that AI is uh, having a lot of litigation around it right now, and there's a lot of controversy about it. I found this was very interesting. This just happened about a month ago. Uh, the Copyright Office uh, rejected copyright protection for the winner of the Colorado State Fair Art Contest. Um, and you can see the image and the, uh, the ribbon. And it wasn't because he didn't reveal that it was generated in mid-journey. It was because he revealed it was created in mid-journey. And he listed mid-journey as the author of the art. And that's where the Copyright Office said, nope, we have to have a human author it. So there's a lot of uh, issues here. You know, should you, should he have taken full credit for it and not mentioned mid-journey and copyrighted the image? Who knows? But there's a lot of issues. There are a lot of infringement rights issues that are going on too. Um, I, this, I'm gonna not harp on this topic too much, but be aware that um, if you use something in the style of Pablo Picasso or uh, Claude Monet or um, uh, Renoir and those people are unlikely to come back and sue you later because they all have passed away a long time ago. But if you use something that is uh, like a Norman Foster or a Geary or a Calatrava or a Renzo Piano, it, those, those people are active and practicing today and they may litigate against you. So a lot of people are using the style of a particular photographer or a particular artist or a particular architect and, and getting images that look remarkably like what you would see from them. Um, some of the AI generated uh, works and some of the companies are, are saying, okay, we, we agree, we've been using their stuff and they're forcing those people to opt out instead of just not having them opt in to using their model. So it's, it's interesting, it's still being litigated. My recommendation, uh, knowing those things, would be, I think, and what we're trying to do here uh, at Haskell is use it for ideation. So I look at it like if you guys use, uh, if you put together precedent boards or uh, use Pinterest to find ideas and put together a Pinterest board, I look at it like that on steroids and that it, it, it's, it's good for ideation. Um, if you are going to publish it to any website, social media, anywhere, I think you should have full disclosure on how the image was created and what AI engine was used to, to develop it. Um, we are not doing that uh, here yet. Um, I just don't believe you should publish it as your own image or an image belonging to a business entity by lacking that disclosure or trying to pass it off as your own. I, I absolutely think that's a bad idea. I don't think that's ethical. And um, that uh, that last item there, I this is where we are starting to say, okay, we're not gonna give it as a deliverable to a client, but if the client came to our office in a design charrette and sat down with us and we say, you know, we took some ideas and here's what it generated, 
And that client looked at a series of images and said, you know, that's interesting or that's interesting. And that's kind of the end of it right now. I think that has value and shows that that tool uh, moved us in a direction. Um, but I don't think it should be a deliverable just yet. So one of my favorite quotes uh, from Neil Leach. Neil Leach is a uh, uh, British architect who's written a lot of books. He's in Cornell. And he, um, he has some great quotes about AI. Um, so we're gonna talk about mass, massive iteration. And I'm gonna give you a real good idea on this. So when we first started using this, this is from back in uh, May of this year. Um, I took in a, a SketchUp model and there were actually more than that view that I'm showing in the upper left. And that model was used as kind of the source along with some prompted text. And in about two hours, we had generated about 45 new ideas. That was when we really didn't know what we were doing. We were trying Stable Diffusion, we were trying Mid Journey, we were trying uh, Dream Studio. And at the time, we weren't really sure how to build our prompts or what images to use. If I was to do that exercise today, that two hours would probably be more like 30 minutes. So, because we were more familiar with the tool and the tool's already better. So out of those 45 ideas, we came up with about five that really stood out again as interesting. You know, some, some aspects of it we, we, we liked. Um, so that gives you an idea. All right, so here's another project we did a little later. Um, again, image, prompt, it developed these four images. We didn't like these four images, so I wanted it to develop four more. And I'm gonna show you in real time, this is a real time recording of how fast it went from the previous set of images to these four images. So. As you can see, it takes right around 12 seconds. So that, you know, there's some time for you to type in the prompt. There's some time to load the image and there's some time in the queue to wait for your turn for it to generate the images. All of that combined with the actual generation of the images is about 45 seconds to a minute, um, just to give you an idea. So you can generate massive number of iterations. Uh, you can take the same prompt and the same image and just keep regenerating. Don't change anything. And every time it'll generate something new. So one of the, one of the things about AI is you don't really get the same result. Even if you gave it the same image and the same prompt, you can't duplicate the result. So you can see it can generate a lot of different iterations. There it is for you one last time. And that speed of that just blew us away the first time we saw it. All right, so now I'm gonna to touch on some commercial AI products, ones that we've been watching, testing, keeping our eye on. And uh, I think you're gonna find this interesting. Some of them you may be familiar with, some of them you may not. So I'll start with the big Mac Daddy, um, Autodesk. Autodesk, you may have known, uh, acquired Revit. Revit was around from 1999 till about the end of 1992, I'm sorry, 1999 to 2002. And uh, they acquired Revit for 133 million in 2002. That's about $215 million in 2020 dollars. Um, in 2020, they acquired a product called Spacemaker for $240 million. And why that? Why am I comparing it to Revit? Well, Revit is the cash cow for Autodesk. The, it's been their most successful product. It's their most profitable product. And they invested more money in Spacemaker. And Spacemaker is now called Autodesk Forma. It is really for uh, urban developers and planners for doing large scale projects. So it's not really what I do as a uh, healthcare designer and planner, but uh, there are people at Haskell that are, are testing this now and uh, using its capabilities. So we'll see where this goes. The next one, and this is one I have played with quite a bit, is Hypar. Hypar is a space planning tool. Um, I was very optimistic about this one when I first started using it, but I uh, soon discovered that it is very limited for what I do. It is very, 
good at doing things like office buildings and cubicle farm layouts, maybe even schools. But for what I do in the uh, ambulatory healthcare or the acute care setting, it's uh, it, it really has no healthcare ability. So I'm optimistic that they're going to change that. Um, one of the people that uh, is a good friend of mine, who's also a healthcare architect, he was uh, recently interviewed by Hypar, and um, they are trying to move into the healthcare market. So we're we're looking forward to that. So, um, but if you are in an office layout or a cubicle farm layout mode, um, I encourage you to take a look at this product. It was uh, pretty interesting. This one, all right, this one is really interesting. After we're done, go to Swap and look at what they have created. And it's just a slick video. It's a slick website with a slick video. The bottom is the screenshots from that slick video. Basically, it's a client calling up a young female architect in the office. And he says, I've got that property on this corner. And I was thinking about putting an apartment building there. And she generates that floor plan, and then she generates the model of the building. He tells her, I don't really like that look. So she generates another one real quick with a couple of clicks of the keyboard. And of course, it gives a rendering too. And he says, yeah, that's it. And then she hits another button, and suddenly she has a full set of working drawings. So it's almost comical in its in its fantasy approach to uh, what we do, but literally in one phone call, everything was done. So I think that's been a, a bit of a stretch and maybe even tongue in cheek, but that's what they're shooting for is completely AI powered construction document in a matter of minutes. So they're a series A funding startup. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on them, but I haven't seen anything really that you could test yet. This one is a product you can test. Uh, we've used it quite a bit for a number of months now. Um, it's made by Evolve Lab. If you are familiar with SketchUp and Revit, um, Evolve Lab's been around providing uh, plugins and, and content for those product, those platforms. And uh, this one uses the Stable Diffusion engine and it integrates it into uh, those platforms. And it kind of becomes like an integrated AI rendering product. Uh, they just recently also created a browser only version um, but it, it it does work as a plug-in. It, you know, I, I've put some of their marketing images up there. I could tell you after playing with it and a couple of other people playing with it, we haven't been able to quite get those kind of images yet. So keep that in mind. It takes a lot of trial and error. And uh, we're still getting images with some anomalies and some scaling issues. But I will say this, they've been updating the product on a regular basis and it's getting better. So definitely one I would I would look at closely. This is a really interesting one. This is made in Spain. If you are in the multifamily residential market, um, I encourage you to look at this one. Um, it's called Architectures Smartscape Studio. It is uh, capable of doing uh, space programming, planning, um, and you can optimize that planning until you hit your uh, cost estimate target number. Uh, they just recently added energy analysis in beta and it's uh, almost done. So it'll do energy analysis on your site uh, as well. It's a really interesting product and um, it's won a bunch of awards in Europe. So um, if you are in this market, I strongly encourage you to take a look at this. They do have a trial that you can download on this one too. And a lot of you may be familiar with Adobe products. Um, Adobe has introduced a couple of things like outpainting uh, in uh, Photoshop and some other products, but they also have Adobe Firefly, which is a standalone product that you can subscribe to for a measly $4.99 a month. Um, it does the extend to image really well. It does the generative fill pretty well. The 3D to image leaves a little bit to be desired. Its big claim to fame though, is it's commercially safe. And, and what it means by that is they've taken a very strong uh, stand in how they are using and uh, their model, how they're training their model, their engine. 
And that is, it is only using stuff that AI, uh, that Adobe owns uh, all the commercial rights to. So it's not going out there and scouring the internet for images. It's actually using just what they feed it and they own. So from a corporate point of view, uh, from a business point of view, or even a, a, a college or a university's point of view, this is a very safe product to, to you know, incorporate into your workflow. All right, so this is another one. Um, I doubt anybody's seen this one. This one is brand new. Um, it's probably been out maybe five weeks now. It's uh, called lookx.ai. Uh, it's based out of LA. Um, they have actually focused this. Um, I don't know if I can, you can see my pointer here, but see where you can come over and say your design field, architects or interior design. And then you could also tell it what type of image you're uploading to it. So the interface is really interesting and it rides on top of the Stable Diffusion platform. There are a number of products that do that. The one, the first one that came out was Dream Studio and then Night Cafe was right on its heels and then Prom, uh, Pro Me AI came out. They're, they're good, but for what we're talking about here for architecture and interior design, this one is really slick. It, the way it organizes images and the way uh, you can set the settings, um, I was very impressed with. It also is very easy to train your own um, engine. So you can take some of your images or upload some of your engines, uh, images and create your own um, AI engine for it to run for you for style or for objects. So really interesting. This uh, A lot of these are based on you buying credits um, and then using those credits. So it's a little bit like using the one-armed bandit at a casino and it's very addictive on all of these where you just sit here and just hit generate, you know, load an image, do some prompts and just hit generate and it you know pops up four new images and it uses credits. So it's, <laughs> it's I, I, I'm telling you, it's very addictive. So I say, be careful with it. All right, so now I'm gonna get into the open source and low cost tools. And these are the ones that really uh, dominate the market. So the big one you may have heard about uh, last year when Dolly came out and started doing this really kind of quirky art, I'll call it. Um, and then there was Dolly 2. They just come out with Dolly 3. Um, Dolly is now uh, tied in with chat GPT-4. So making it very powerful to combine uh, prompting that's generated through chat GPT and DALL-E uh, is an interesting dynamic. They were also formed a partnership with Microsoft, the 800 pound gorilla we all know and love. And um, there's a lot of things here. So between OpenAI and Microsoft, this alliance is uh, something that's gonna make it a very powerful tool in the future. So. It's not one of my favorites right now, but uh, definitely keeping an eye on it. And then this one right here is Stability AI, uh, has an, um, an open source uh, option. If you are really into Python scripting and GitHub and Hugging Face and things like that, and you know what I'm talking about, then I encourage you to download this and set your machine up uh, to be its own AI engine. Um, it, you, it will run on your GPU. So you gotta have a powerful GPU. So if you have a, a really powerful uh, RTX card with you know 16 gigs of VRAM or 20 gigs of VRAM on it, um, and you are comfortable with setting something up that's pretty technical, then you can set this up and you don't have to pay anything and you can run as much AI as you want. So you won't be buying credits like with LookX or Dream Studio or Night Cafe. You'll be able to generate these right on your own desktop. Um, if you're not comfortable with that and the interface is a little more clunky too, it's a little more geeky, um, then I would suggest just stay with the others. They're very economical. 
Um, I forgot to mention that like Dream Studio, you buy credits, you can buy like $20 worth of credits and they'll last you quite a while. Um, and the same thing with LookX. So it's, you know, think of it about $20 a month. Um, but this is uh, something I did set up on my machine and, I, and you can download the newest engine they train. Every time they publish it is, uh, they, they put it out there as open source and you can download it on your machine. So I'm using the SDXL 1.1 uh, model right now. All right, and here I'm gonna say, this is the kind of the king of the hill. This is one that when we started looking at all these AI engines, I had a very unbiased approach to it. I tried everything that I can get my hands on and um, I ended up kind of uh, enjoying Mid Journey and the quality of the images of Mid Journey. And I, uh, let me tell you that on some of the other products, you get strange anomalies on those. You get some strange scaling, you get some strange text, you get strange objects sticking out of things. And you get a little bit of that on Mid Journey, but not nearly as much. And the image quality on Mid Journey is just another level higher. So Mid Journey was launched in, in July of 22. Uh, by Christmas last year, they had reached a million users. And by this month, they're at uh, 16 million users, just under 16 million users. And that's paid subscribers, by the way. The minimum su subscription is what I use, the $10 a month, which is more than enough, uh, by the way, um, as far as buying time on the, on the Mid Journey bot. Uh, there are higher plans. But that, um, that platform offers a lot of value for $10 a month. Um, it's currently at version 5.2. Uh, two weeks from now, the uh, version 5.3 is coming out, and then they're hoping to get six out by the end of the year. So it's on a rapid development plan. I mean, uh, just what I, since I've been using it since April, I've been blown away with all the updates. Um, it's gaining about 90,000 users a day. And every time you're on it, there's between 1.5 million and 2.5 million users worldwide on the server. Um, and by the way, that server's in San Francisco and the creator of it is David Holt, Holtz. And this is an American, American product. Okay, I've covered a lot of stuff, but now we're gonna kind of jump into uh, mid journey and Discord, and I'm gonna just show you a couple of workflows just to give you an idea of what you can do with it. And the lack of control and the a little bit of control you do have and you know, learning how to use that a little bit. So there's a couple of examples here. So bear with me, hang in there. And, and if you're an advanced user of MidJourney, I apologize. This is kind of very high level beginner stuff. All right. so. The interface um, is the biggest issue with Mid Journey for a lot of people, but particularly people that are not familiar with Discord. Think of Discord as a texting platform where you talk to the AI bot. So you're texting the bot information and then the bot texts you back images, okay? Discord is available on iPad, and I use it a lot on my iPad, frankly. Uh, your PC, it's available on your Mac. Um, it's also available um, on Linux. Um, it's available on Xbox. It's available on PlayStation. I mainly use it on my uh, Mac, PC, and, and iPad. So it's once you have it set up, it's it's really great, I think. I've, I've become a fan of it. So there are three primary commands, and I'm just going to touch these. The one that does a lot of it is slash imagine, and then there's slash blend and slash describe. I'm gonna show you all three of these workflows real quick. Don't need to write this down, just kind of hear it for the moment. And you'll, it'll, it'll all become apparent in a minute here. So a basic prompt with slash imagine is you put in slash imagine, you hit enter, it comes up prompt, and then you type something. So like, if you can see on the bottom here, you could say bright orange California poppies drawn with colored pencils. And it will generate an image just off that text. So it's real easy. There are more advanced prompts you can do where you can use the text prompt, but you can also bring in images and you can also set parameters. And the parameters control things like aspect ratio of your image, uh, upscaling, some other, 
uh, which which AI engine to use. You can go back and use older AI engines if you like the way they look. So if you don't like version 5.3, you can say go use version 4. Um, and there's also some anime looks. If for people that like anime, they can choose that model or, uh, as well. So again, just high level. And just so you understand the text prompts, what do you type in there? But the AI engine's been trained to learn a lot of things like what the subject is, what the medium is, what the environment, lighting, color, mood, composition. And it understands simple words like this or simple phrases. And this is just a great example of them. So you don't need to write these down, just kind of understand that. And then these are the basic default settings uh, that are in Discord for Mid Journey. And usually the default works great, but you can go in and change them if you want to. All right, hanging in there. So now I'm gonna show you just, yes. All good? Okay, thought I heard something. Heidi, we all good? Yeah, go ahead and keep going. And if, okay. for people, if they do have questions, go ahead and just put them in the chat and we'll catch her. Yeah, put them in the chat and I'll, I will get to them. I'm gonna try to uh, go real quick through all this. All right, so the text prompt method. So here um, I recreated one, which is one of the first things I ever did in Mid Journey and I redid it the other day. And, um, and it was just a simple text prompt. So slash imagine prompt. And I put in fabric structure in the ports with people walking around it in red robes. So it comes back and Mid Journey always generates four square images, okay? And that's what it came back with, all right? So, you know, you can see just a little bit of text and it creates some pretty images. Images are really high quality in Mid Journey. The look is astounding. So now when you look at the panel, I'm gonna point here. This is panel one, this is panel two, this is panel three, this is panel four. And this is the upscaler. So I can upscale any of the panels or I can vary any of the panels or I can hit this button and vary all the panels. So right now I'm just gonna upscale this image. This is my favorite out of the four. And so once I upscaled that, I, I there was a part of it where I was like, ah, I don't like the fabric hitting the ground here. So I'm gonna hit vary the region. I'm gonna hit this lasso and I'm gonna come over here and just kind of trace around this very loosely, very quickly. And then it's going to generate a new set of quads here. So I looked at those four quads and I, again, I, I happen to like the fourth panel. So I upscaled the fourth panel and here it is. So I don't have any of the fabric laying on the ground. I got more red robes, you know, especially here. And I was able to kind of control that part of the image. So see what I mean? You have a little bit of control, not a lot. And then that's the final image right there. So moving quickly, I'm gonna show you another workflow. And this is using your sketches and your images for blending into something. So we're gonna use the blend command. Remember that, slash blend. So this is a SketchUp or Revit lobby model. This is a photo of an actual project of mine uh, in Jacksonville, where I live. I'm in Florida, by the way. And I just took that photo, which I like some of the elements and some of the um, uh, finishes in here. They're kind of timeless and um, blended the two. Now, I'm not going to get exactly this or this, but I'm going to get something close that's based on that. Oh, well, by the way, you can do up to five images. I only did two, but you can do five, up to five. So it generated this quad here. Uh, I kind of like the number two panel. So I upscale number two and it generated this. So I can now manipulate it. So when I took that panel that was upscaled, I said, you know what, show me more of the lobby. So I said, zoom out and it gave me these four images. I also told it to go from square to 16 by nine. You notice the aspect ratio changed. And so out of the four images, I liked this image. And you're gonna see that here. But as I mentioned, a lot of these AI engines generate anomalies. Here's a great example of mid journeys anomaly. So it kind of created this hole up here. I said, I don't know what that is. Put this kind of glass 
handrail up here. Didn't want that. I don't know what this is. And then this area over here, I didn't really care for. So what I did next was I said, okay, let's, uh, let's lasso all these. As you can see here, um, I said, let's go ahead and uh, add some additional prompts in here, which you can do once you uh, put it in this uh, very region mode. And I said, make it ultra realistic at 8K and, and keep the aspect ratio at 16.9. And it came back with this image and it fixed everything here. It kind of fixed this, it fixed that hole in the ceiling, fixed whatever this was. And then I decided, you know, this foreground is pretty blank. So I said, all right, let's go ahead and end paint this. And I said, give me an area rug and furniture on top of everything. And it came back with this image. So again, now I've got an idea. This idea, I took two images, blended them, and I was able to generate this idea for a lobby in about under 10 minutes, all of that, all of the steps under 10 minutes. So now, in an hour, I can have five new ideas for a lobby. I could pull other images and blend them with that other sketch and come up with five different kind of schemes for ideation. So that's a that's an interesting workflow in, in itself. So this is another workflow I'm going to show you. This is the last workflow, um, and this one works really well too. I'll, let, I'll give you a second to read the uh, the, the quote there. And so this is kind of what I believe that we're going to augment our intelligence with AI, and that's the optimistic approach. All right, so this is one of my favorite things about Midjourney. It's called Describe. Um, really, really interesting stuff comes out of Describe. So slash Describe, and you load your image, and it comes back with what you see here: these four descriptions. Okay, of my image. This is an actual photograph of a project we just finished here in Jacksonville. It's a NICU PICU tower. And this is the lobby in this, this critical care tower. And it came back with these descriptions. And the descriptions can be used to generate new images. So like the first description generated these four second one generated these four and so on. So 16 images, again, probably four or five minutes. It even picked up, let me show you something. Here in the background, my client has a bass tournament every year for fundraising for the hospital. So back here, there's a mural, you can barely see it. It's got a manatee, it's got fish, it's got birds, it's got all sorts of underwater stuff. If you look, a lot of that was picked up. Like there's a big mural there with fish swimming through it. Um, it's got trees on this one. Um, you can see it picked up a lot of the finishes, uh, picked up the colors and the upholstery. It picked up the terrazzo flooring. It put some patterns in this one, you know, so it, it it's interesting what it does. So out of all those 16, I said, wow, I really like these five. And I started looking at them and said, okay, I really like this one. This one's kind of where I wanted to go with this. So the problem is it's still a, kind of a square image and I wanna see what's over here on the right. So there's another function I could do, which is, this is called pan, but it really doesn't pan the camera. It actually is extending the image to the right. So when I chose this, it then generated these where it panned the image to the right. So now I liked this one and I did a custom zoom. And I zoomed back a little bit and it created these four images, all right? Out of these four images, I liked this one. But being me, being picky, I didn't like the hanging light sculpture here. This was some really strange furniture and this little potted plant I didn't like and the scene here I didn't like. So I had it redo those. And it generated four more images. I liked this one. And here's the final image. So I got furniture that works. That little weird plant's gone. I like my view out my window. The light fixture's gone. Again, I was able to kind of control what I was getting. So if you understand that workflow, you could see how you could steer the AI in a certain way. You don't have finite control over things 
but you do have the ability to develop new ideas. I hope that was helpful. So this is a, a project I did for a friend of mine uh, 25 years ago. I did it Max V-Ray. And it was, um, he said I was under the influence of something when I when I designed this. It was uh, pretty wacky and out there at the time. So I had to describe this image and it came back with the four ideas here. And then it developed these. So I don't think I was under the influence. I do think Mid Journey is under the influence here because there's was some really crazy ideas, but you could sit here and, and control how much it deviates uh, by manipulating those prompts a little or changing the variability setting that I showed you earlier in Mid Journey. So, but you could see how you could create some really interesting stuff by using that describe workflow in particular. Okay, I'm doing pretty good on time. Um, last bit I wanted to touch on was new features in Mid Journey. Um, if you're excited about Mid Journey, again, I was I was unbiased when I came into it and started playing with all these tools, but I've become kind of a fan of Mid Journey, and a lot of it is because of the founder. The founder writes weekly newsletters to all the users. He writes them himself, and he tells you what's coming, and he changes it constantly. He says, I wasn't happy with the way that was working, so we're not going to release that yet. <laughs> so uh, Wednesday night, after I had already finished this PowerPoint, he sent out a new newsletter. And instead of the res the images that you're going to get, so right now, those those that quad of boxes, those are 512 by 512. And when you upscale them, they go to 1024 by 1024. Um, the announcement before was in version 5.3, which comes out in two weeks, it was going to double that upscaling to 2048 uh, by 2048. Significant bump in resolution and quality. He, uh, Wednesday night, is now saying it may be, that's 2K, by the way. He was, he's saying we may be 3K, we might even be 4K. So he, you know, he's changing it up. So we're, uh, he's teasing us a little bit. So we're going to see what happens there. Um, they're talking about the ability for it to understand your images better and the scaling of objects. Sometimes when you add people like um, where I went and did the in painting and you add people in your uh, prompt, sometimes the scale of the people is not quite right. It's not nearly as bad as some of the other AI engines, but sometimes there's anomalies like that. Supposedly scaling of objects is going to get a lot better too. Um, he's talking about a next generation of aesthetics. He held the release because he didn't think the image quality was there. And so he is now releasing it. And he, he says, we're going to be blown away. So, um, and you can see the image quality that you get is already great. So it's even going to be better. Um, you know, better prompt and image understanding. Um, here's the big one. He's doing a two-step approach to move away from Discord. Um, the first, uh, and I guess this is going to be out in about six weeks, um, the browser is going to let you, for existing users, control all your images that are stored in Discord in the browser platform. You will not be able to create images yet. And the second version will be you can do it without Discord. You'll be able to do everything in a browser platform. So that's a, a big for a lot of uh, users that don't feel comfortable with Discord. So they're expecting that by Christmas. We'll see. Um, he's doing a lot of, he's taken all that money he's raking in. If you saw 16 million users and not all of them are the $10 subscribers, some are the much higher dollar subscribers. Um, he's raking in a lot of money on this. So we're expecting that he's reinvesting into uh, more speed in the data centers. Um, and that, will you know, the speed, once you're, uh, once you have the bot, the speed is already fast. It's the queuing. So if there's 2.5 million users queuing images, sometimes you have to wait. And that wait can be, I've, I've had that wait be literally nothing. It averages around 10 seconds. Um, but I've had that wait be as much as two minutes when there's a lot of people using it. And then the big thing, which is in version seven, which will be out beginning of 2024, is instead of just getting images, getting 3D models that then you can bring into SketchUp or Revit or Max or Maya or whatever, um, Blender, and, and use. 
and then video clip generation. It will do some video clips now, but it is supposed to be greatly expanded on videos. So those are the big updates coming. All right, that was fast. I think I'm at 11.45 on my end. Um, we have time for some questions. So. So if you guys have questions, you can unmute yourself. You can raise your hand or you can put them in the chat. But we've got about 10 minutes for questions. All right. I see over here I have um, one from Jim Dawkins. Is that the first question uh, it looks like? Um, what are the future of these mid-journey journey images becoming smart enough to reproduce themselves in AutoCAD, Revit, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, don't know. Now, that last item I just mentioned about it being able to produce 3D objects, that is something now that you're going to take a, a raster image and then produce an actual 3D model. So if you, um, the way I look at it right now is I do a lot of, in those lobbies, we do a lot of hanging sculpture or other art. But if you were doing some kind of sculptural element and you liked it and it could create a 3D model and now you can bring it in to your uh, your you know presentation for fundraising uh, images, uh, and you can drop it into the lobby of your model in, in Revit or in SketchUp or whatever platform. Uh, that's probably that first step. But I, I imagine down the road that you're going to be able to get some actual floor plans and other items um, from mid-journey. Um, I think Hypar, the one that I showed you, and um, Architectures, those export directly into Revit too. So. Um, you're you're starting to see AI generating things that are going to go into your 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 Revit platforms. Okay, and then thank you for the summary. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, some uh, Dan put out there are any of the educators here using this or trying it out, and I don't know the answer to that, but I hope what I kind of was able to do was plant a seed for all of you, and get you to not fear it or not understand it and um, try it out. I'm telling you for 10 bucks, I, I, you know, I encourage you to have a glass of wine and try it out. You know, uh, it's, it's a little clunky to get discord installed, but if you're not in, comfortable with installing anything, I encourage you to go to the uh, dream studio option or the look X option and, and just, You'll get some free credits right out of the gate and you can play with it and then you can buy other credits. So that's a great way to introduce yourself to AI. All right, super inspired, I'm glad to see this. <laughs> um, how do you see this uh, impacting the industry on the whole? Do you see it as an opportunity to automate processes and actually liberate more billable hours and time for design? Or do you anticipate instead a shift toward quantity and volume with a de-emphasis on quality? Oh man, these are these are debates that we are having in our company as well. Um, every time I've seen something that comes along and it's going to save us a bunch of time, what I have seen historically is then the expectations change. So. I can show you uh, a building that I worked on in 1983. It's a high rise 23 story building and it had 12 architectural sheets. But if I was to draw that same building today, it might have 200 sheets. And that's because we're using them and the expectations have changed. So I think that's what may happen with some of that time gain. Um, so, but I do think it will help us. It is a tool that will allow us to leverage um, ourselves and, um, and, and, and create possibly more efficiency and more billable hours. Um, it, I will say this, there are two books I encourage everybody to read. One is by Neil Leach, you saw a lot of his quotes there. He has a book out that's called Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and AI. Um, and then the book I just finished reading is Phil Bernstein's book. Um, a lot of you may know him. He's um, used to be with Pelly Clark, and then he was the vice president at Autodesk, and um, he's with Yale School of Architecture now. His book that came out at the beginning of the year was Machine Learning, um, 
Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Um, and that book is good. And they get into more of how it's affecting the architecture profession as a whole. Uh, good reads, both of them, outstanding books. Are there any software programs that will detect AI other than visual items? There are, there are. Um, I don't really um, use them um, and I'm not looking at them, but there are that do it. Um, I Because I've been in the world of design visualization for so long, I can always tell what's a rendering and what's a photo, you know, as things have gotten kind of close. Um, so, uh, but I could tell you, even with a good trained eye, it's getting harder and harder and harder to tell. I honestly would not trust anything you see going forward <laughs> about anything, particularly when it comes to images with people. Uh, I've seen some amazing stuff coming out of these platforms. Um, and my, again, my focus is architecture and interior use, interior design use. Um, uh, can, real quick, oops. Ted, we had missed a question earlier on from Christine yeah. that says, uh, what are the next step after you general uh, generate the ideas on mid-journey? Will we be back to the traditional design process? Yeah, that, that's where we're taking the ideas and then doing them in a traditional SketchUp or Revit modeling process and incorporating some of the ideas uh, right now. So, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of that Pinterest board where it, when it becomes a 3D modeler, I think we're gonna see a great expansion of its use. Um, but right now I'm using it as a Pinterest board. Hope that answered that. I can, I, I can certainly put the books in the chat. I'll do it as soon as I can. <laughs> um, separate seminar type course using AI generated imagery. Um, prototyping it in real life. Um, this is a long one. Uh, the biggest moral hurdle I've been dealing with is the hesitation of using this in design studios because I have a feeling that it will negate the critical thinking processes we are trying to instill in our students. If it were my course, I would still expect full process work, et cetera, from my students and attempt to hold them accountable to the work they are doing. I, I agree, I've had this discussion with other educators in July, um, I, but I, I think what you need to do is incorporate AI into your uh, studio's process because it is the future. And I think you may have uh, work where they can't use it and work where they do use it. But um, uh, to ignore it or ban it, I think is a bad idea, frankly, because uh, it is the future. It, it, it's, I don't think it's going to be stopped. Even if all the litigation goes the wrong way, it still won't be stopped. Yeah, there you go. There's uh, Machine Hallucinations by uh, Neil Leach and then uh, the Phil Bernstein. Somebody put it in there for me. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Was there any other? Did I miss some? Um, I think Laura had a question of what do you think about AI built into Photoshop? Do you think it gives more control to the user? Um, yeah, we've had a real good luck with that, um, uh, particularly on that, what we call the out painting. In other words, um, you the image uh, is developed to a point where we, we wanted to see it in the background or we wanted to create an area where we could put some text next to it, maybe in a PowerPoint. So we use the out painting just to kind of zoom it out, sort of like what I was doing in Mid Journey. Um, and that out painting, you know, fills in, you know, what wasn't in the scene. So uh, a couple of things we're, we're kind of discovering is we used to sit there and put all the entourage, you know, in Max and Twin Motion and Unreal and Blender uh, and V-Ray. We used to put in every tree, every bush, every plant, every person, every rock, every bench, every, you know. And now we're kind of like, why do that? Let's let, let's see what, you know, uh, we can do without painting. And we're getting some pretty good stuff. So, um, uh, you know, you can see there's a lot of trial and error and experimentation. And um, it's fun. Did I say that? It's fun. <laughs> so I think you should have fun with it. And uh, and don't be scared of it. People, people think uh, this is going to take their job away. 
I think if we're in control of it, we're using it and we're having fun with it, it will never take our job away. I have All a right, couple the, questions in Q&A if we have time. Okay. How yeah, we so we are technically out of time, but we left a five minute buffer. So I'm okay if everyone else is okay, if we spill just a little bit, but I will have a hard stop at, uh, on the hour. So go ahead and ask questions for the last little bit here. Yeah. So the first one was, if you load images of your own, do they go into a catalog or become the property of mid-journey? It does. Worried about unintentionally making a client's work public. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to read, like any software, you need to read the, the licensing agreement, but everything you do in mid-journey is public. I don't know if you noticed the green box, but in the $10 plan, the $10 a month plan, everything you do is public. I can't remember the price point. It's pretty high, but you know the two hundred and fifty dollar a month plan, it's private for you. So you can buy that, but uh, there's nothing that we're doing that we um, uh, the images that we have are already public images that have been put out on LinkedIn and you know other platforms. So when we put them in there, we're not worried about it. But you do absolutely need to be careful with that. And then the second question, would universities be able to have these softwares for their students be free so they can be ready for work after graduation? And then a follow-up, do you think AI is at a detriment to students? Okay, as far as free, there are a lot of free trials that'll get you some. Uh, like I would say, go sign up for credits on Dream Studio, um, LookX and um, uh, Night Cafe and get those free credits. Um, definitely, there was a beta for Mid Journey. It's been closed for a long time, so you're you're going to have to pay for Mid Journey. Um, but again, it's nominal. It's ten dollars a month. Uh, it, if, I mean, ten dollars a month. I I don't think I've got more value for anything for ten dollars a month. As far as it being a detriment to students, I think if you keep your program intact with all the fundamentals you're teaching, and incorporate this into the to the process at some point and not ignore it, I think that's the best thing for students, prepares them for the future. Was there another one? Okay, I think that gets through all the questions that were in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, oh, sorry, I missed one from Roberto Ventura. Let me get that one. Um, it says, I'm feeling a little flat-footed and insecure about my AI awareness. I'm hoping to plunge my department into this headlong. As a reference, how would you rate yourself on the AI liter literacy spectrum? Are you zero, Ludite, or 10 Star Wars droid? <laughs> oh my God, I was a Ludite in January. I was a, you know, just a, 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 a fledgling or a, a chick at, in April. And now I'm, I'm, I'm not a 10, I'm, I'm a five, I'm a six. Um, there, is, there are a lot of people out there that apparently don't have anything better to do than do this. So, and they post a lot of stuff out on YouTube and other platforms. Uh, one of the platforms uh, is called Medium, um, and it's uh, it's dedicated to just articles on AI, and um, that one you have to subscribe to. So there, there's so many resources out there now, and so you know a lot of it is. Oh, and by the way, in Discord, Discord, other people can connect with you. And when I started finding people out there um, and um, they started looking at things I was doing and they, I started looking at things they were doing and you just, it, it when they're online, you can see when they're online in Discord, you can connect with them and you can ask them questions and they'll volunteer a whole bunch of stuff. They'll send you like, oh, here's my list of my, my best hundred prompts. You know, and there's people that put out uh, prompt guides and cheat sheets for mid journey and stable diffusion. So there's a lot of resources out there. Okay, we are out of time. I'm gonna thank Ted. I've got their thank you screen up here. It has his name, company and email address. So thank, thank you, you, Ted, a big round of applause and thank you for your time today. Yep, if you want my, here it is, I think there it is. Yeah, if you guys have questions, uh, you can uh, email me and uh, just just put the uh, in the subject line. It was the IDEC conference, and I'll see if I can answer your question. 
Thank you. Thank you.